Video 16, about 30 seconds in, when I actually go on the rather long minecart ride. I had intended it to be quiet and have the game music playing in the background. I forget if I actually added in that music myself or if it occurred naturally. But the reason I'm commenting here is because apparently my TV was on in the background and a lot of people came out and said, Hey, were you watching something? Hey, I hear this show in the background. And it... <clears throat> it really surprises me that people could even pick that out. I've listened to this several times myself, even cranking the volume up, and I hear very little. Certainly not enough to actually determine what show is playing. So I'm continuously surprised by how inhuman some of your ears are. Video 16, 11 minutes, 50 seconds in. I mentioned that there is a, there could potentially be a little village off to the west side of the map, and it indeed was a village. Um, what was less obvious is off to the east there was another smaller village, but I figured that one was small enough and ambiguous enough that I didn't need to worry about doing anything about it. It wouldn't be something that would draw attention. There was still a couple people pointed out that there was another village over there, and I was kind of hoping you wouldn't notice. This village, though, it used to be a village. Anyway, I went back and flattened it for the sake of the narrative. And what I did here was pretty simple, really. All I did was look at the map, get the map, or get the village on map, put the map away, flatten the village, and then make sure not to look at the map again while anywhere near it, so the map wouldn't update with the lack of a village. So by the time I walked back here, the map would update and remove the village. I intentionally left a bunch of dirt and such around as well where the various roads and buildings were. Something I kind of brush off, but done to give the feeling that there was something there if you paid attention. Now, narrative-wise, once again, this was simply our friend not liking the idea of us meeting other people. He wanted us all for himself. Video 16, 17 minutes, 50 seconds in. I mentioned that we need to get back home, and we need to get back home quick, because it was getting dark out. I completely underestimated how dark it was, and I completely underestimated how much monsters hurt you when you're not wearing armor. So this was yet another time during the series that I actually died. Video 16, 27 minutes, 30 seconds in. I'm actually not doing nearly as much editing here as I would otherwise. And some of this is because my father was mentioning some of the more popular Minecraft series on YouTube, and how they don't really do any editing. It's all just about their personalities and them talking and going and doing it's like screwing around, and you come in for them and not for the actual series, the actual player. Or the actual uh, gameplay. And though this is understandable, at the time that was... Or I've realized by this point that that's just not the kind of series that I'm trying to make. And that's not the kind of commentary that I'm trying to give. And really, it didn't work because of the narrative. I'm essentially playing a character. I can't just BS about everything under the sun in this particular series. Video 18, right at the start. The music that was playing was Episode 1, Mission 1 of Doom. Doom being one of my more favorite games, and I figured going into the nether, it was only fitting 
Though, sadly, this Minecraft series wasn't quite as testosterone-driven as that. Now, one thing I do in this episode as a whole is run over to a completely different fortress and wander around trying to find resources and find my way around and the like, and... Originally, when I was coming up with this episode, I wasn't really sure how I wanted to go about ending it. I wanted to do something else when I get back home. I wanted to do something to show the further changing of the world. And I wasn't sure how I wanted to do that. I was actually thinking of doing something similar to the uh, cave from before, where I just get completely lost and end up finding a different nether portal, and then having to run home again. I'm kind of glad I didn't do that, as it would have been a little bit of an overuse of the same idea. Ogre actually suggested placing down signs, say from some kind of deity or something, because I did have the idea of some kind of greater being helping us. Or if not helping us, maybe a message left behind by the people that sealed away friend in the first place. So the signs would be messages from them saying something like, What have you done? Why would you let, th why would you let it free? or something like that. Something really vague, and I think that idea may have subconsciously turned into the sign maker later on, though that actually had more to do with um, Skyblock, but I'll get to that when we get to it. Video 19, right at the very beginning. A couple ideas that we went through, or one of the other ideas we went through on how to alter the world for when we come back was to raise the water line. And though a neat idea, it doesn't immediately tell you the world is ending, and it would have been really hard to do. What we ended up doing just here with this, this is purely a texture pack. It wasn't the simplest texture pack in the world to do, but it was indeed just a texture pack to do this. It made... essentially all it did was make dirt gray and wood gray. It also changed it so the leaves on the trees were much more sparse, though this did create a very weird um, tiling kind of problem with them. I also then changed the colors of grass, which can't be altered directly in the terrain PNG. There's another file for that entirely, so I changed that, so all the grass looked very red and brown. Just overall looking kind of like the world's coming to an end. The tricky part of all of this is that the color of the birch tree's leaves are not actually the same, or is not actually handled in the same way as any of the other textures. In fact, the color of those leaves is hard-coded into the game. So despite everything else, there was no way for me to change that color. What I ended up doing was simply flying around and replacing every birch tree leaf in the area with a leaf block of a different type. That was troublesome, to say the least. But once again, this is the same thing as before, where our friend is merely slowly flexing his abilities and figuring out how his abilities work, if even accidentally. It's like maybe he didn't intend to do this to the world, but he flexed a little bit and said, all right, that's how this works. Quick note here, um, video 19, 7 minutes, 45 seconds in, when I'm going for the overkill achievement, I tried, and heaven help me, I tried to get this achievement without using the potion. I did all the damage calculation myself, I did everything I could, and as far as I could tell, it is 
physically possible, but I still couldn't get it. This was all off screen, and I think on screen a while back I simply mentioned that we're going to wait a little bit to get this, and that was until I got the Potion of Strength. Now, I actually had a lot of trouble figuring out how to farm Endermen. Because even getting all of those orbs, it's not intended to be something that you can just sit down and do. It's intended to be something that you do over time as you're playing. But of course, I hadn't set it up that way, and I did a whole lot of... I did a whole lot of um, looking around and trying to figure out a good way to farm Endermen, and really the only response that I found was, you have to be in the end to farm Endermen, which doesn't help at all. So I did a whole lot of experimentation and testing and trying, and trying to find a good way to farm Endermen. Trying to find a good way to get their delicious Ender Orbs. I was even considering a montage at one point of just going back down to the very bottom of the cave where all the lava was, pouring water over all of the lava and making obsidian. And just saying, so I'm gonna go in and fight them, and then I just run out and start hammering on enemies. And I wanted, an, I wanted something that was at least feasible, though, and I tried that, and it simply didn't work. I think I had my diamond sword, a diamond sword, half-worn down before I even got any, like, before I got two ender orbs. So, overall, not super useful. In fact, I was experimenting so much in trying to find a way to farm Endermen that I invented this contraption. Which actually doesn't work quite as nicely as I would like, and I never finished it because I realized it wasn't going to work. But the whole idea is you have water up top and you have an area in here that is in shadow, so Endermen can spawn there. Of course, this needs to be done at night, too, and it's done in the middle of the ocean, so we'll get more monster spawns in here. But Endermen... Well, I hit the switch, and the water flows down. I then, um... I actually push these blocks out so the water flows off the edge how I want them to flow. In the center, this opens up so more water drips down through the center coming out down here. And now this is two blocks high, which means Endermen will not be able to fall off the side, but creepers and zombies and skeletons and everything will. And I am on peaceful, aren't I? Yes. So now we get a fair number of monsters spawning in there, so you hit the switch. And the water slowly flows down and pushes all of the enemies off to the side. Now, this is an interesting way on how to separate the Endermen from the regular monsters. And in theory, it works right up until you realize that Endermen don't like water and they'll just teleport out of the water. So, yeah, the whole idea was botched. It looks fancy, though. Video 20, 12 minutes, 25 seconds in. Note that I still have not fixed the um, spawn point that the compass points to. This is actually my second attempt at recording this little trip, though, mostly because the first time I completely forgot to get all of these things. The jack-lantern, the bed, and the compass. Completely forgot. Video 20, 15 minutes, let's say 40 seconds in. I see that pumpkin there. That is yet another of the... That is yet another one of the mysteries of this playthrough. I don't know why there was a single pumpkin there. Usually they are created in patches. But I'll also say that this was... A moment ago you saw a black flash. And that was once again due to a converting error in Vegas. Because I didn't close out of 
Vegas and then reopen it to convert the video. Video 20, 16 minutes, 20 seconds in. I mention, you're mean, you know that. And that's actually, um, once again, me conversing directly with our friend, where I'm kind of pointing out that our friend is... Perhaps intent... Perhaps it's... Perhaps it's um, supposed to be taken in a more joking way, but it's showing that he does have a little bit of a mean streak in him, just making fun of me, poking fun at me, that kind of thing. Video 20, 20 minutes, 50 seconds in, or probably closer to 40 seconds. I point out that that one tree is green. That's mostly me drawing attention to the fact that I did not change every tree in the entire world and every one that would forever be generated to one that is not the um, birch, tree uh, birch tree leaves. Okay, this is starting to look On a more narrative side, I'm more showing that this transformation isn't completely world yeah. over. It is centric, which means as opposed to changing the fabric of the world itself, it was an effect that came out from a source. Video 21, 3 minutes, 50 seconds in. You saw that spider kind of glitch his way through the floor? That's actually because right there, Minecraft crashed. I couldn't tell you why, it just crashed. I reloaded the game and started recording again as soon as possible. Edited that together as smoothly as possible. As to the ladder earlier, it has been mentioned that you can hold shift while on ladders, and you will hold onto the side and not be constantly going up and down. Though I know this now, I did not actually know this at the time, so um, that's something I learned from the viewers. Video 22, right at the beginning, I'm walking into the... the end. And the majority of this fight is actually done on a server. And it was done on a server, so once again, my father could play cameraman. However, this very beginning part, where you see from my point of view, is actually done single player. And it was done single player, so I didn't have to bother mimicking my inventory and my level and everything before coming in here. So I just made sure that when we then went to friend's point of view, that I was standing in pretty much the exact same place as before. I stood back so he could watch the entire thing while staying safe. It would overall give a more epic feel to the entire battle, but it was also building up to the very end. Now I am very sad that we cannot get the boss's health bar, over top of my over top of friend's point of view there wasn't too much i could do about that though since he was doing the entire recording with the user interface turned off and in multiplayer the boss's health bar does not show when the user interface is turned off it also makes it a little bit easier to see without all the fog around the corners of the screen i also added a fair amount of the echo to my voice to show distance. It made the whole thing seem a little bigger and nastier and the like. I will say though that overall this is a very boring fight. The Ender Dragon fight you see, his main offense is to push you around, is to knock you around, and normally that would do damage to you as well, but Wearing full diamond armor, it does not, which means it's pretty much just the slow process of taking out all the healing pillars and then taking out the ender dragon. It also didn't feel very epic in the or originally, just because there was no music in the end, just this dead silence for so long. So that's where, for, throughout the ending, I actually added a lot of uh, music myself. This is all music from Minecraft. You can listen to it on the various music boxes and uh, music discs and the like. And I do a lot of cutting around, especially once I get on top of the tower. But I do a lot of cutting around just because this fight on our own took about 
40 minutes. And it was 40 minutes of really boring. And of course, I had to sit there and watch through the entire time and try to pick out good scenes here and there. This was entirely done post-commentary as well. But it was all to put together a decent end product for everyone else to see. Once I get on top of the tower as well, a lot of the tedium came from that despite my father being in creative mode and monsters should leave him alone, the Ender Dragon still went for him fairly often. In fact, he seemed to favor my father over me, which made it very hard for me to hit him. About 6 minutes 50 seconds in, when I'm fighting the Enderman, I hadn't had any trouble fighting Enderman before because I knew I could attack their feet. Or at least the couple that I had maybe had to fight at one time or another, but this is where I figured out it actually was a difference between server and single player. Because being on the server here, I'm actually having a really hard time fighting this thing. Because I was thinking I could attack its feet, and as it turns out, I couldn't. 11 minutes, 50 seconds in, when I fall and die. Um, funny that you see all the Endermen crowd around. Those are all the Endermen I had ticked off, just glancing around too much. Of course, then, my father walks up, grabs a diamond sword, and shows his user interface. Not only so you can see the sword, but you can see that he's stepped into the role of actor, as opposed to simply an observer. And he then goes to deal the finishing blow to the dragon. This is actually an exceedingly important part plot-wise, in that... I died. This is the only time in the entire series, aside from the grand finale, that I died in. And in me dying... In me dying... Our friend realized something very important. And in him defeating the Ender Dragon, he realized something very important. Now, what he realized... What he realized is that I'm mortal. Let's climb up there and of all the things that I've of all the things that I've shown him, I've always come off as not only an equal but a mentor, someone that he can look up to. And he viewed me as an equal in that regard, despite that he had these godlike powers, because I still had something that he didn't, which was my knowledge and experience. And it's right there when I died. He realized that I am not perfect, that I am mortal. And at that moment, his opinion of me changed. S knowing that I'm mortal, I instead became something less than him. He thought less of me, and he thought of me more as something to occupy him something he could use than something that is equal to him. That was the defining moment here, though a lot of people thought that perhaps Friend gained a lot of power from defeating the Ender Dragon. It was mostly his opinion of me that changed. Especially in defeating the Ender Dragon himself, because he accomplished something that I did not. So now, twice over, he thinks himself better than me. I'm no longer his equal and his mentor. I'm merely something to entertain him. The end credits starting up. These are the original end credits to Minecraft, this giant philosophical poem. And originally, I didn't really have much use for this poem as far as the narrative went, so I figured I'll leave it off to the side and it'll be something neat and interesting that um, could certainly be true. I mean, just in the sake of you hearing it at the end of Minecraft, it could be true in the same sense. 
and it was really only partway through the second season that I thought to start to include it in the narrative. But that's something I'll speak about a little bit more in the future. We're going on to the second season now, which is where our friend, knowing a lot more about the world and how the world works, is starting to flex his power and see what he can do. This is also where he sees me as more of a toy than a friend anymore. <laughs>